Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today we will hear uh, one case and then take a recess and then return at 3 o'clock to hear the remainder of the calendar. So those people appearing in the cases of Devere versus Falk and Dennis versus United States of America may, if they like, excuse themselves at this point as long as they are in this courtroom at 3 o'clock. We are, will now hear the case of Guam Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists et al. versus Joseph F. Ada. I should tell counsel that we have read the briefs and you do not waive anything in your very fine briefs by not arguing at, at oral argument. We would appreciate if you would direct your argument to those issues you dream to be of greatest importance. We will begin with, uh, is it Mr. Linton or Mr. Leibowitz? Mr. Leibowitz, you may begin. May it please the court. This is an appeal from the- Mr. Leibowitz, you're gonna to have to keep your voice up if you would. I this, is an, this is an appeal from the court decision below in validating a Guam statute which regulated abortion. The decision below held that the Guam statute was unconstitutional as a violation of due process as elaborated by uh, the Supreme Court in Roe versus Wade. And it also held that 1983 was a separate ground under which the statute could be in, in, invalidated and therefore attorney's fees could be awarded and were awarded to the um, plaintiffs by the government of Guam. In a separate action taken after the um, appeal, there was a hearing on the question of attorney's fees and the court below awarded $440,000 to plaintiff's counsel um, for work done up to that point. That calculation is not on appeal here. The um, uh, judgment has not been entered um, as a courtesy to plaintiffs that uh, wish that the judgment at that point not be entered. What was the basis for the award of fees? The, uh, there was a calculation put forth by the, um, uh, by the plaintiffs based on, um, um, uh, I, guess, I guess, standard uh, decisions on, on hourly rates plus lodestar no, rates. I don't mean the amount, but what was the basis, the legal basis? Oh. Uh, it was based on, on the fact that 1983 uh, applied and therefore under 1988 the, um, uh, the court could award fees to the plaintiffs. And having held that 1983 was an alternate ground on which the um, plaintiffs could recover, he held that, that attorney's fees were available under 1988. He found that the suit was not against Guam as a government but, as a, but against Governor Ada officially? No, um, uh, what he held was on the 1983 issue that it was a uh, suit against the government of Guam official, you're right, the, gov the um, uh, government, uh, Governor Ada acting in his official capacity, but that it was not barred by Narengas versus Sanchez on the grounds that injunctions were not barred by that case. Having held, therefore, that 1983 was an alternate ground, and the court made, made no bones about it, that the 1983 ground was solely a ground dealing with attorney's fees. Is that coming so, up to us on appeal? Yes, that is before the, 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 that is, in this appeal, we are arguing that attorney's fees should not be awarded, that 1983 does not apply in this case, that Narengas versus Sanchez 
bar totally the applicability of, of uh, attorney's fees. I, you I you gonna... describe uh, Section 1983 as an alternative ground. Isn't it the ground? Um, how, how else do they get to the constitutional issues except through 1983? I think they can, they can sue directly under, uh, arising under, under 1331 uh, as a violation of the Constitution, and 1983 wouldn't be necessary at all. And in fact, that's what the court below held that um, uh, 1983, in this case, was meaningless well, from a substantive point of view. 1331 may give them jurisdiction. Does it give a cause right. of action? But you would sue directly as a violation of, of um, your constitutional right. You would not need any special legislative um, uh, requirement to permit you to go to court, nor would you need special legislative requirement to permit you to get to federal court in the case. I'm concerned with this attorney's fee issue because it seems premature for us to consider it now since we don't have the judgment of the district court on that issue before us. Well, the court, the court found, we're, we're equally concerned with it, Your Honor, because it involves substantial sums of money. Um, uh, the court below found, however, that the, that the attorney's fees could be awarded, and that is properly before the court. The amount of the attorney's fees, which is a calculation of hourly rates and so forth, is, is not before the court. But the issue of whether Narangus has been properly interpreted so that 1983 and therefore 1988 um, uh, comes into play, that is properly, we would argue, before the court and is right for decision by the court. Um, perhaps since, since um, uh, Judge Choi has, has raised the point, I should uh, continue on the 1983 point. That isn't the order necessarily we're going to take it, but um, uh, responding to the, to the judge's uh, uh, questions. Uh, in our view, 1983, the, um, uh, the perquisite for, for the award of attorney's fees under 1988 turns on Narangus versus Sanchez and the interpretation of that statute. Of that case. The holding there. Um, made clear that 1983 does not apply to the territory or to the territorial officials acting in their official capacity. Um, the argument in the case... Well, you said it doesn't apply. You mean it, that territories are not persons? That's correct. You're, that's correct, Your Honor. Because, I should of course, that states aren't persons either, but 1983 applies in the states. That's right. And 1983 clearly applies. We're not arguing that it doesn't apply to the territory of Guam. It would apply to, in our view, to territory, um, territorial officials acting in their individual capacities and, municip and municipal municipalities and municipal officials. Then why wouldn't it apply to the governor in his individual capacity? We would argue that it would, but the court below held that the governor was not liable in this case in his individual capacity. And that, ca and that issue was decided below and plaintiffs have not appealed it. Right. So that for the court to find that there is a, an attorney's fee award in this case, the court must hold that acting in his official capacity, 1983, is, is, he is covered by 1983. Well, why was the lower court incorrect in finding that he was acting in his official capacity as governor? We would hold that, that the Narangas versus Sanchez case if uh, held in a, in, a, in a broad way that there was enough federal control in, in the territory, in the federal government over the territory, that whether this was a case for money damages, which it was in Narangas, or an, or an injunction, which it is in this case, really makes no difference. Well, it certainly didn't say that in Narangas. Well, uh, uh, Your Honor, the, the, the court just didn't say anything about No, the, it just talked about there. damages and said that He's not a person under 1983. Right. In his I, official capacity. Uh, right. But the court, the court's thrust, the entire uh, uh, argument of the court, was solely in terms of control. There was yeah. it, that it was an issue of federal control, and if you if you follow the reasoning of the court, federal control would hold over the territories whether this was a money damage action or an injunction action. Either way, the federal there was sufficient federal control to be exercised over the court. Um, to be exercised over the territory so that it wasn't necessary to make a special um, uh, action necessary to the federal court. It's quite different than the will case, which is what the court below relied on. The court below was saying, and plaintiffs have urged, that the exception made in the will case 
which was um, for injunction should apply here. But in the Will case, which was the entire thrust of the case, one was dealing with immunity. And the argument was well, how, to, how to apply 1983 in light of the continuing desire of the court to have the 11th Amendment immunity continue to apply to the states and the common law sovereign immunity apply to the states. When it reached the end of that and said, look, under those circumstances, 1983 would inevitably degrade the sovereign immunity and the common law immunity found in the 11th Amendment and, and, and the common law to the state. When it had reached that point and therefore said that uh, it does, 1983 does not apply to the states or to state officials in their official capacity, it was then that they dropped the footnote and said, of course, it will continue to apply in injunctive action from prospective release because sovereign immunity in those cases did not apply. You were not damaging the immunity. And they specifically said that in the footnote itself. In the territorial case, in Narangas, the, the rationale was quite different. It could have been the same rationale. This court had decided, the Ninth Circuit had decided, Marx versus the governor of Guam, and had decided that there was a common law immunity in the territory of Guam. At the Supreme Court, the argument was made that the 11th Amendment did apply to Guam, and the court made a point, the Supreme Court made a point of saying, we're not going to cover the 11th Amendment issue. It's not relevant given the basis on which we're deciding this case. And they decided it on federal control. If you, if you follow the reasoning, therefore, it doesn't depend on whether one implies a footnote or whether one made a mistake in not having a footnote. It's the fact that a footnote isn't called for. No exception at all is called for if, because federal control applies and equally the same reasoning would hold if Narangas had been an injunction action. You could write the same opinion as the court did in an injunction action without damaging at all any of the reasoning of that court. And it's for that reason that we feel that uh, it was um, uh, misapplied in this case and that the injunction action um, uh, should not hold to, to a territorial official uh, acting in his official capacity. But isn't it also equally true that with, you could apply it to declaratory and, and injunctive relief without interfering with Narangas? Narangas dealt only with damages. That is correct. All right. But th th that, that is correct. It only dealt with damages. But I'm saying the rationale of the court would go to, our, to um, uh, uh, injunction as well. Let well, I me mean, just um, point out the, 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 the court's own statement on this. Thus, unlike the state courts over which the federal government had no control, the territorial courts were created by acts of Congress with judges appointed by the president and were under the general control of the federal government. So that there was no, there was no need under these circumstances as the court was reading the ranga. How does that square with your earlier answer to my question that yes, 1983 does apply in Guam? It applies to territorial, to territorial officials acting in their individual capacity, in our view, and in the municipalities. Can't you make all the same arguments about uh, federal control that you just made? You could, uh, you could, but I think that there is specific language in the statute, which we wouldn't read out of the statute, although the court almost did in Narangas, that said that, there are, that the territory is there. It's, the person applies under, under acting under color of law in violation of color of law of state or territorial law. We think that it has some meaning, and we would argue that it has meaning with respect to a territorial official acting in his individual capacity. But the thrust of the argument could go all the way, Your Honor. That's true. I, I wanted to make one other point um, uh, before leaving the 1983 argument, and that is that this court has taken a position in two cases now in Sakimoto versus Duty Free Shoppers and also in its decision in Narangas uh, that the governor, government of Guam and government of Guam officials are part of a federal instrumentality. That in effect, 1983 does not apply, which was the argument in Narangas as decided by this court, because it was a federal instrumentality. And that in the constitutional jurisprudence, the normal state um, uh, um, negative, negative pregnant on, on the Interstate Commerce Clause would not apply in, in Sakamoto because, again, you were dealing with a federal instrumentality. We, the government of Guam, doesn't, don't necessarily agree with that reasoning. We do feel that there is a, a, a greater role for the government than that. But if the Ninth Circuit... But you, don't, you aren't assuming that Guamanians are second-class citizens, are you? No, but we're... In terms well, of the Constitution of the United States. 
No, not at all. All right. But but we're we're also saying that if the the Court of Appeals, the Ninth Circuit, the, this panel, um, continues its vision of the government of Guam as a federal instrumentality, which was permitted under the Supreme Court opinion in Narangas, um, which left open that issue, then of course 1983 would not apply once again, and therefore uh, attorney's fees would not would not be available to the plaintiffs. I don't know if I, I, I don't know if I made, made no, I understand made point your there. argument. Thank you. Um, uh, as I said, we, it, this is a, a, a uh, I don't know um, how continuing that vision is of the, of the Court of Appeals, but, but the Ninth Circuit now has taken it in two cases, and we feel that it, that it uh, most recently in its version of Narangas, and so we, it, it's important. Um, I'm going to now go back to where I was initially going to start, if that's, if that's all right with the Court. And, um, well, you're following a very good course, because the purpose of oral argument, of course, is to answer our questions. We have read your briefs, so we right, thank you right. for responding well, to the Court. Well, um, uh, I, I, I'm now going to address the, um, uh, the initial case, uh, the initial argument that I was going to make, and then uh, my colleague, Mr. Linton, is, will um, handle the facial validity of the statute. Uh, I will argue what the court below argued was the applicability of federal law question. Uh, will you please speak for, directly into the microphone, the I'm sorry. The applicability of Roe versus Wade to Guam question. Or, that will be taken care of by Mr. Hinton? No, I will, I will handle that. Okay. Mr. Linton will argue the facial validity of, of the statute under the existing precedent. You have approximately 16 minutes to go. If you wish to save some time for rebuttal, well, keep that in mind, please. Oh, yes, yes, ma'am. The argument uh, here depends on whether the um, Congress has taken action so to preclude the government of Guam from legislating in the abortion area. The, the plaintiffs argue that the Elective Governor Act of 1968 determines the question. The, that act, is, as you know, says that due process clause applies to Guam and is sent to the same extent as it does to a state of the union. And therefore, the Roe versus Wade, the elaboration of the due process clause, would apply to Guam. In our view, that's just not so. That misconceives the purpose of that statute, and it, mis and it does not cite at all or is aware of the precedents that have been, been conducted in the Puerto Rico uh, context in, in uh, language which is very similar to the language we're, we're talking about here. Are you speaking now about the Mink Amendment? That's correct. All right. The Mink Amendment um, was passed, and initially at least, was introduced by the Senate, uh, in the Senate, at the initiative of the administration. At that time, the, um, uh, uh, something very novel was happening in terms of the um, uh, territory's um, course uh, of, of self-rule self and self-autonomy. For the first time, um, the territory was going to have elected officials, elected by their own people, um, both of the executive and the legislature. And there was a concern by the administration that that government now would act in such a way to discriminate against statesiders coming to Guam or who were in Guam at the time. To prevent that, the administration introduced or had introduced in the Senate language which would uh, uh, state that the Due Process Clause, the Privilege and Immunities Clause, and the Equal Protection Clause would apply to Guam in the same way as it applied um, to the states of the Union. Their concern was not that they were going to give additional rights or additional protections or additional prevention of action by, um, by the Guam legislature as a result of that act. They were concerned that the, that the that legislature and that newly elected governor not take action, particularly tax action, that would discriminate against statesiders coming to Guam. In the your view then, would Guam be free uh, to discriminate uh, to segregate their schools according to ethnic groups so long as they don't discriminate against statesiders? No, um, uh, no, Your Honor, I don't think we're, we're, we're arguing that. Um, uh, we're well, arguing doesn't that follow? I mean, Brown against Board of Education is simply an interpretation of the Equal Protection Clause. That, well, maybe more of that, but uh, that's correct. But we're not arguing that none of these provisions apply. What we're arguing is that at, at in 1950, the Due Process Clause and the Equal Protection Clause had already applied to Guam. We, um, there were already, as a result of that so-called Bill of Rights in 1950, these, um, uh, these protections available and preventions available. All but, we're saying but in Brown versus Board of Education 
uh, came down in 1954. That's and right. going back to Judge Canby's question, would it mean that the Equal Protection Clause was frozen as of 1950 with no. respect to Guam? No. no. Our, our point, I think, has been misconceived below also. We're not arguing on that anything was, free, was frozen. Uh, it, it, it's, it, uh, it's almost foolish to say that um, and, and to misconceive our argument. Obviously, the law evolves. The question is the way in which it is going to evolve. And the issue here is not that, uh, that anything was frozen, it's that the Congress in, in, in um, passing this statute, did it intend to prevent on the major social issue of the day, did it intend to prevent the governor, government of Guam from speaking? Um, there is no doubt that if one is talking about criminal procedure or the segregation issues that the uh, Judge Canby mentioned, um, that cases that are decided by the Supreme Court, circuit courts, and so on, would obviously evolve and apply to Guam. No one is saying that that is not true. What we're saying is that there's nothing special that had happened in the, in the um, Elective Governor Act of Guam that would suggest that where there is the kind of power that now exists in the Congress, which can annul Guam legislation anyway, and still has that capability, that it intended to act in such a way that the privacy right was suddenly incorporated, sub silentio in, in, just, in, in, in uh, extending the due process right, so that the Guam legislature could not act in this area. Well, that could, is, that could, the Congress, could the Congress overrule Roe versus Wade? That's a constitutional question. The question is whether Congress at this point could overrule the action by the Guam legislature on, on, on to regulate this case if Roe if Ro versus Wade does not apply to Guam. And we would say that it could. That today, assuming, Ro, assuming our argument holds, and that, Ro versus, that there has not been a clear congressional statement on the privacy and incorporating your privacy right to the people of Guam, that, and if that was permitted for the Guam legislation to to go forward, the Congress could override the Guam legislature. That means that Guam is free now to outlaw contraceptions by your argument, is that correct? I believe that's true. Um, the, the, um, I want to make a point that the Guam legislature um, had within it its own uh, ounce of caution, that it had within it a requirement that there be a referendum on the statute. The, um, that referendum, um, plaintiffs have introduced in the record an indication that in their view, uh, the Guam statute would fail in that referendum, that a majority would vote uh, against it. Certainly what polls there are show that it is very split. The Guam um, uh, legislation uh, went through a number of different um, uh, permutations. Um, uh, so that this argument is hotly debated as in Guam as it is elsewhere. Um, it is not that the, the uh, uh, Guam legislation is not sophisticated. On the contrary, it is. And in our judgment, the, the um, people of Guam should have an opportunity and, and, and have the right um, to vote on this, on this matter. I'm going to stop because my time is limited um, and allow my, my colleague to ask the other part of it. Thank you, Mr. Leibowitz. You can figure out how you're going to do your rebuttal between okay. the two of you. Mr. Thank Linton. You. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Again, for the record, my name is Paul Linton, L-I-N-T-O-N, and I'm a Special Assistant Attorney General appearing on behalf of the Defendant Appellant Joseph F. Ada, Governor of the Territory of Guam, in defense of the Guam Abortion Statute. May it please, please the court, my co-counsel, Mr. Leibowitz, has argued that the abortion jurisprudence of the Supreme Court does not apply to the territory of Guam. If this court should decide otherwise, then it must determine what is the present status of that jurisprudence. And that is the issue to which I will devote uh, my argument this afternoon. It is our position that the standard of review applicable to abortion legislation has changed in two significant respects. First, a majority of the Supreme Court now recognizes that there is a compelling interest in the protection of unborn human life throughout pregnancy, not just after viability, 
And secondly, a majority of the Supreme Court no longer recognizes a fundamental right to choose abortion in any and all circumstances. Did Webster overrule Roe versus Wade? Uh, not directly and not sub silencio. However, the standard of review did change in that the court is now according greater weight to the state's interest in protecting unborn human life. The court, in our judgment, a majority of the court, when you consider all the opinions together and the opinions to which they referred uh, among the five justices in the majority, clearly are saying that the state's interest is compelling throughout pregnancy, not just after viability. Wouldn't we be, be presumptuous of us as an inferior federal court to the Supreme Court to now say Roe versus Wade is overruled because bits and pieces taken from opinions of several justices indicate that there may now be a majority? Your Honor, we're not asking this court uh, to do what it cannot do. It cannot say that Roe has been overruled. It can, however, recognize that the law has changed. The law has changed in two respects, uh, both of which I've mentioned, and I think either of those is sufficient to sustain the constitutionality of this statute in this facial challenge. To my knowledge, every court of appeals that has considered this question since Webster has suggested or intimated, somehow recognized that Roe has been modified in some sense by Webster. The Third Circuit in the Casey case, the Sixth Circuit in the Eubanks case, the Seventh Circuit, two of the judges, uh, Judge Posner and Judge Flom in the Ragsdale case, the uh, Eighth Circuit in the Planned Parenthood of Minnesota versus Minnesota case, and the Eleventh Circuit in Planned Parenthood versus Miller. We are not asking this court to overrule Roe. We understand this court does not have that authority, but we are asking the court to take a look at the status of the present abortion jurisprudence, which we suggest has changed. When we look at the court opinion in Webster, we see a plurality of justices saying the state has a compelling interest in protecting unborn human life throughout pregnancy. Where does it say that? I couldn't find that. I could see where it had an interest, and I could see where it cited the Thornburg dissent for saying that it had a compelling interest throughout. I couldn't find where at this that opinion, the plurality, Justice Rehnquist speaking for four, said that they had a compelling interest. Uh, Your Honor, throughout. I believe that in the in one of the uh, among other places, in one of the footnotes to the plurality opinion, uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist. Uh, states that uh, it is their judgment, that is the, the judgment of the plurality, that the trimester system should be abandoned, and I believe in the text he did say that the state's, my recollection was that the state's interests are compelling throughout pregnancy and citing other you know, earlier cases. He certainly said that the interest continued throughout pregnancy. I'm just not sure that he said it was compelling, but that brings me to another question. When you say that the state's interest is compelling throughout pregnancy, does that mean that it necessarily prevails? I think that depends upon the reason that a woman is seeking an abortion. And since this is a facial challenge, we can't look to any specific reason. There are no plaintiffs before this court saying, we are seeking an abortion for this reason. None of the plaintiff physicians is before the court saying, I have a patient who has sought an abortion for this reason, or I am representing a class of women seeking you, abortions you for this reason. You would say, though, that if the woman simply says, I want an abortion for reasons that are sufficient to me, but I don't even care to disclose, the state's interest would overcome that. I don't but think there's any question about that, uh, Your Honor. Interestingly, in this record, testimony from two of the doctors, Dr. Griley and Dr. Freeman, strongly suggest that they don't even ask women why they're having an abortion. Dr. Griley stated in his deposition, this is at CR 189, pages 20 through 23, that he considers it unethical to ask a woman why she's seeking an abortion. He just does them because they're lawful. On demand was the expression he used, just that, on that's demand. That's really what Roe protected, isn't it? Pardon me? That's really what Roe protected, isn't it? Roe may have protected that through some stage of pregnancy, but we're suggesting that once you posit this compelling state interest throughout pregnancy, and not just after viability, that there is no longer a right to choose abortion regardless of reason. Even Roe recognized that with respect to post-viability abortions. The court stated the state may prohibit abortions after viability except to save the life or health of the mother. Why? Because the state's interest at that point is compelling. If we extend that compelling interest throughout pregnancy, our conclusion that we draw from that is that the state may prohibit non-therapeutic abortions throughout pregnancy. Justice Blackmun in his dissent in Webster uh, referred to what he called uh, the state's unquestioned authority to prohibit post-viability non-therapeutic abortions. But if that interest, if that compelling interest exists throughout pregnancy, as we submit that it does, 
then the logical conclusion is that the state may prohibit non-therapeutic abortions. The question becomes, is that sufficient in a facial challenge? In our, in our position, it does. Because the issue is not in a facial challenge whether or not this law is constitutional in all possible applications. It's whether it's unconstitutional in all possible applications. That is the plaintiff's burden, clearly, under the Supreme Court doctrines of facial challenge rules. They've enunciated this in the context of abortion cases and outside the context of abortion cases repeatedly. Six justices have said this in the context of abortion. They must show it's unconstitutional in every conceivable application. That is their burden. It is not our burden to show that it's always constitutional. And that's because it is, it is a facial challenge. Mr. Linton, your time is up, but I will give you and Mr. Leibowitz five minutes to respond. Thank you very much. For the foregoing reasons, we ask the decision be reversed. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Ariola? Ariola, is that correct? Good afternoon. May it please the court. My name is Anita Ariola. I am a native of Guam and I represent the plaintiffs' appellees, many of whom are in court today. This case concerns the right of women on Guam to choose to have an abortion, a right that was held fundamental in Roe versus Wade, and a right that applies on Guam with the same force and effect in the United States as in any state of the United States. Ms. Ariola. Yes, Your Honor. There was a Guam Penal Code Section 274, Supplement of 1964 and 1970, that prohibited uh, abortions. What has happened to that law? The, there was a subsequent legislation in 1977 where the Guam legislature adopted an abortion statute that pretty much tracked the holding in Roe versus Wade. That law would have been um, repealed and amended subsequently by this present law. Of course, since this law has been enjoined permanently by the district court, our present law in Guam now remains the 1977 law, which is contained in the Guam Penal Code. The 77 law, is that uh, almost identical to the 1964 law? I don't believe it is, Your Honor. Um, the is it broader or, or? It is broader. It is broader, and it pretty much tracks Roe versus Wade. It contains all of the different um, first trimester, second trimester stages that Roe contained. For example, it allowed pregnancies within the first 13 weeks of pregnancy, etc. Thank you. Your Honor, also, this case also concerns, in addition to the right to privacy, um, the right of the people of Guam not to be treated as second-class citizens. Roe versus Wade has been the most important decision for women's self-determination. It has permitted women on Guam and in the mainland to make that most personal and intimate decision of whether or not to bear a child, in line with their own individual, religious, moral, and conscientious beliefs. Roe has also permitted Guamanian and American women alike to be free from the specter of illegal abortions and the serious medical and health consequences associated with forced pregnancy. Guam's Public Law 2134 imposes a near total ban on abortions. It contains only a very limited exception for the life or health of the mother that is so vaguely worded as to render that exception meaningless. It is perhaps the most restrictive anti-abortion law in the country and it unquestionably violates Roe versus Wade, free speech rights, religious freedom, and it is void for vagueness. I will address the right of privacy argument first. Roe remains the law of the land today. Webster, Hodgson, and Ohio, the most recent Supreme Court decisions, leave Roe versus Wade's holding undisturbed. Indeed, the Guam law would be unconstitutional not only under the majority opinion in Roe, but also under the, the dissenting opinion, which indicated that there must be an effective life or health exception for the mother, which is certainly not the case here. There is no clear majority in Webster, Hodgson, or Ohio that, Ohio that has overruled Roe or applied a new standard of review for a woman's right to an abortion. More importantly, none of those cases provide the basis for outlawing abortion at all stages of pregnancy, as the Guam law does. Are you, you're familiar with the recent Third Circuit case. Uh, they, they fashion a new standard of review from the post-Roe cases, uh, Webster and Hodgson. Uh, 
Do you think that they did that incorrectly? Yes, we do, Your Honor. We think that Casey, the Third Circuit decision, was wrongly decided for a couple of reasons. First, they're simply, they simply misapplied the Marx versus United States decision, which held that we must look at the narrowest grounds upon which the members agreed or concurred in the judgment. They misapplied Mark by holding that Justice O'Connor applied an undue burden standard in Webster. That is certainly not the case. At least three times in her concurring opinion in Webster, she explicitly states um, that she is applying strict scrutiny standard of review under existing precedents, namely Roe, Kalati, Akron, and Thornburg. We believe that the Casey decision was also erroneous in holding that Justice O'Connor's concurring opinion um, applied the undue burden standard in Hodgson as well. As you all know, Hodgson is a minor's right to an abortion case. And in footnote 35 of his opinion, Justice Stevens take, took great pains to make clear that it was upholding the 48-hour waiting period for minors and distinguish the 24-hour waiting period that was struck down as unconstitutional in Akron. Ms. Ariola, does the standard of review really make a difference in your case? Your Honor, we would argue that it does because we believe that it's important for this court to reaffirm that Roe remains a fundamental right. But truthfully, in answer to your question, this law does not pass constitutional muster under any of the standards of review, whether it deems it to be a strict scrutiny standard, an undue burden standard, or even a rational basis standard. Thank you. But again, we believe that the strict scrutiny standard applies here. In Roe, the Supreme Court found that the state's interest in maternal health is not sufficiently compelling to warrant interference with the abortion decision. Roe also held that the state may, if it so chooses, assert a compelling interest in viability, but even a compelling interest in the protection of a viable fetus cannot override the woman's interest in her own health or life. Public Law 20, 134 violates Roe because this statute gives more rights to the fetus than to the woman at every stage of pregnancy. The evidence in our record demonstrates that this act would force 10 and 12 year old victims of rape and incest, of which there is a very high incidence on Guam, to carry these pregnancies to term. It would force the woman who appeared at the Guam legislature and testified at that hearing that she had had an anencephalic fetus, that is, a fetus with no brain, that she must carry that fetus to term with no apparent reason other than that this government would impose its will upon that woman. Wouldn't that be an exception under the present law? Your Honor, that is something that is certainly subject to question. One of our claims here is that even the exception for the life or health of the mother is not at all uh, or entirely clear. In fact, we would submit is, it is very vague and very ambiguous. What do those terms mean? Gravely impair the health of the mother. It's not entirely clear that an anencephalic fetus would. Our doctors have testified that they would not know whether that would constitute an exception um, under this law as presently worded. Going back for a minute to the burdens on the women's right to choose an abortion. Unlike women in the United States who can travel with relative ease to neighboring states in order to obtain abortions, that is simply not the case for women on Guam. The evidence in the record shows, undisputed by defendant, that women on Guam would have to travel thousands of miles to Japan or here to Hawaii to have safe, legal abortions. They might also travel to Manila, where abortions are illegal but also costly. The delay inherent in traveling these distances is seriously detrimental because the evidence indicates, as plaintiffs have shown in the court below, that abortions become riskier as the pregnancy progresses. The only interest asserted by defendant is that of protecting human life throughout pregnancy. This asserted interest is not compelling because exactly the same, forth of evidence, same type of evidence was set forth in Roe and the court there decided that Roe precludes a finding of when life begins by a court such as this. In fact, the Supreme Court stated, quote, we need not resolve the difficult issue of when life begins, end quote, finding it inappropriate for the judiciary to make this kind of determination. In short, we ask the court to declare that the act is unconstitutional under Roe and to reaffirm that Roe is necessary for women's freedom. I will turn now to the void for vagueness argument. Having established that Roe, Akron, and Thornburg are still the law of the land, this court should strike the act as void on its face. 
Even if we concede, as Mr. Linton argues, about the test to be applied for a facial challenge, there is no set of circumstances under which this statute may be applied in a constitutional manner. For example, in a statute containing a spousal veto provision, even if some spouses consent to an abortion for their wives, that does not save the statute from being constitutional. The point is that a spousal veto, like a government veto in this case, on abortions is not constitutional. Under Kalati and Thornburg, the Supreme Court struck statutes as being faci facially unconstitutional, even though conceivably in those cases, those, those statutes could have had some valid applications. In addition, this is also an as-applied challenge, not merely a facial challenge. Plaintiffs challenged the way in which Public Law 2134 was enforced and applied in the four days that it was in effect. First and foremost, this act is so vague that it led to the March 20, 1990 arrest of Janet Benshoff under the solicitation provisions. The free speech claims that were raised by the plaintiffs below are not rendered moot because Section 3, as I will argue later, contains a procurement section, language that provides that every person who procures a woman to take medicine, drugs, or a substance to cause an abortion is guilty of a third-degree felony. Did you raise the free speech argument below? For Section 3, specifically? Did you raise it at all? We raised free speech arguments for the solicitation provisions in Sections 4 and 5. Right. Yes, we did, and but we believe that the evidence... Of course, that's not being appealed, right? I'm sorry? That part's not being appealed? No, the defendant has chosen not to appeal those sections. Secondly, the act is so vague that Maria Doe, who dropped out of this lawsuit because she was so fearful of having her identity revealed in a community as small as Guam, and other women besides Maria Doe were denied abortions. Third, the act is so vague that doctors stopped prescribing birth control pills, morning after pills, and IUDs, and from performing abortions. Fourth, I thought your, isn't your vagueness argument directed toward the, uh, the exceptions for health of the mother and uh, risk of danger? I, I thought that's what the vagueness argument concentrated on. That is our facial vagueness challenge, but we are also arguing that this statute is vague as applied. So we are asking the court to do both. The facial vagueness, do you think that you might be met by an answer, well, we don't, I can imagine, say, the Supreme Court uh, take something very hypothetical looking at this case and saying, well, you argue that if this is, if there's a prosecution or something, all these things will come up, but we don't really know how Guam's going to apply this. We don't know uh, what the fact situations will be, and, and uh, it's premature to invalidate this whole thing on vagueness grounds yet so early. Well, actually, Your Honor, as I was getting ready to say, the other evidence in the case is exactly that we do know how Guam would enforce it. Um, for example, the fourth piece of evidence that I was getting to was that the day after the law was, um, uh, enact the bill was enacted into law, the chief of police on Guam sent a memo to the attorney general's office it is contained as an exhibit to his deposition where he stated, I am not certain about the terms of this statute. I am referring all matters from here on end to the attorney general's office. He also sent that memorandum because he was fearful, in part, that his police officers would be subject to false arrest lawsuits. More importantly, the evidence in this case shows, as Exhibit 2 to the deposition of the Chief of Police, that the Attorney General of Guam herself issued a memorandum to the Guam Chief of Police, the Guam Memorial Hospital, the only public hospital where abortions are performed, and the Department of Public Health and Social Services, the only public agency that provides family family planning services, that she, she thought that the law presented difficult and sensitive law enforcement problems. She recognized that there might be arbitrary enforcement of this statute and referred all of these departments to refer all matters concerning this law to her prosecution division. So we have an admission by an official of Guam that she did not know how to apply this Guam, this Guam law, that it presented difficult and sensitive law enforcement problems. So we do in fact know how Guam would have applied this statute, and that is they were uncertain about how to apply it. Did the district court address this issue? 
The district court addressed um, the vagueness issue briefly by stating that the, the specific terms of the statute raised due process questions because they lacked any precise definition. And I will get to that argument now, which is, in fact, as Judge Canby pointed out, our facial uh, constitutional challenge. And that is that the terms of the statute itself are so vague and uncertain that we do not know what it means. For example, Section 3 the one that creates the exception to the outright prohibition on abortions provides that an abortion may be per performed if, quote, two physicians who practice independently of each other reasonably determine, using all available means, that there is a substantial risk that continuance of the pregnancy would endanger the life of the mother or would gravely endanger the health of the mother about the only phrase that persons of ordinary intelligence can agree upon and understand is the phrase, two physicians. And that is clearly unconstitutional under Doe versus Bolton. I, I seem to recall in the record a report by the U.S. Navy, a U.S. Navy doctor that they apply that all the time. No difficulty, the two physician requirement. Well, Your Honor, the, what the Navy did not do is they, they did not provide the court or the plaintiffs below with an adequate description of what their policy was in terms of abortions. But of course the Navy generally does not provide abortions and certainly on Guam they do not either. Um, I think your honor though that we have to make clear that our plaintiff doctors stated in their testimony and in their affidavits that they would not know what that means because it's not just two physicians, it's two physicians who practice independently. What does that mean? Even the chief of police when questioned in his deposition stated that two doctors who were the chairman and the vice chair of the Guam Memorial Hospital Board of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, he would not consider that they would be practicing independently. So he would not consider the two of them to fall within this exception to the statute. Clearly, it's not just the two physician requirement, but it's also in the statute what it is that they are required to do. The terms of the statute, as I have stated to them, to the court, are nowhere defined. They are subjective, and they do not provide the guidance necessary to make even the exceptions meaningful. Because the act reaches constitutionally protected conduct, imposes criminal penalties, and is so vague, we ask this court to hold that it is void on its face. The third ground on which we ask this court to invalidate this statute is on the Establishment Clause grounds. Let me just ask a question about that. What if this statute had Excuse been passed in New York, or say California, and uh, you talk about the excessive entanglement because a majority of people apparently on Guam are Catholics. But what does that have to do with the establishment of religion? in the sense that if a majority of any people in any state vote for something, is it relevant that they happen to be belong to a particular religious faith? Your Honor, our argument not, is not premised on the numbers or the percentage of Catholic people on Guam. Our argument instead is premised on the two prongs um, in the Lemon versus Kurtzman case, and they have to do with what is the primary actual purpose of this act. It is our contention that the primary purpose of the act is to advance religion. Well, you're, you're talking about the second prong, the primary effect, and the third prong, excessive entanglement. I'd like you to talk about the third prong. Well, the excessive entanglement in this case has to do primarily with the fact that the government of Guam has endorsed a religion, that is, the Catholic religion, and has entangled unconstitutionally the government of Guam with religion. How do you say it's religion. endorsed a religion? I'm sorry, Your Honor? What is, what is your evidence that the government of Guam has endorsed a religion? It has endorsed the religion as follows. First, the evidence in our case shows that the author and the sponsor of Bill 848, which eventually became Public Law 2134, introduced the bill because Guam is a, quote, Christian community, and because, quote, we determine what it is that we have here, end quote. Secondly, Governor Atta has advanced as the official position of the government of Guam in this case that, quote, to the extent Catholicism can be considered a custom that justifies the passage of the abortion law, it has been so integrated into Chamorro culture that to be Catholic and to be Chamorro are one and the same. Third, Where did he say that? He says that in his brief, which is on file in this court at CR 157. I believe it's at page 42. 
Third, the committee report on Bill 848 summarized the testimonies of individuals who testified before the one and only public hearing before the Guam legislature on this bill and concluded that the overwhelming majority of those attending the hearing supported the bill on the grounds of express religious belief or orientation. This evidence is manifest that the primary or the actual purpose of the Guam law is to advance religion. Like the case in, of Edwards there, versus Aguilar. Is there anything in the law itself, in the bill itself, that evidence is a promotion of religion? Yes, there is. What? That is the preamble of the act, which states that human life begins at conception. Does that Unlike, promote religion? I'm sorry? Does that promote religion? It prom yes, it does. Oh. In this case, it promotes religion because it gives legal effect to the legislative finding by outlawing abortions and regulating the doctor's medical practice. The purpose of the act is to give effect to the religious, that is the Catholic religious dogma of when life begins. And a lot of scientific evidence supports that. There may be some scientific evidence that supports that, Your Honor, but that was not presented at, legislative, at the legislative hearing in this case. And the court will note that the legislative history of this act actually shows that most people who testified in favor of this bill believe that life begins at conception based on their religious views. But that could happen in a non... Catholic state, could it not? Yes, it could, Your Honor. The point I think that has to be made is what happened in this particular case? What happened with the passage of this particular statute? Certainly, in other instances, such as in Webster, the Supreme Court found that the preamble in that, in that act was not unconstitutional and did not violate the Establishment Clause, although Justice Stevens would have invalidated it for that purpose. However, we have to look at what is the purpose in this case. What is the language of the statute in this case, and what is the legislative history in this case? I submit, Your Honor, that the evidence that I have just discussed with you shows clearly that this, case, that this act violates the Establishment Clause. Because by enacting this statute, the Guam legislature has sent a message to non-Catholics, like Reverend Cole, who is an Episcopalian priest, and Lori Conworth, who is an observant Jewish woman, that their religions are not valued that their religions are officially denigrated, and that Catholicism is the religion of Guam. This is a government endorsement of religion that is impermissible under the Establishment Clause, and we See, therefore the find the court... The problem with this, it, it, you, you must admit, it's a long road you would be taking us down. Um, you think of the uh, prohibitions of slavery, which were almost and totally sponsored by churches um, and I suppose as you, your opponents mentioned murder uh, might it might be that every single legislator <coughs> votes for a statute against murder on religious grounds but we would still have a perfectly good statute I, I just can't imagine invalidating one even though we had a terrific legislative history saying I'm against murder because I, my church is against murder your Honor, actually, your question was directly answered by the Supreme Court in Wallace v. Jaffrey, where the Supreme Court noted that it is true that a murder statute may be advanced on religious grounds or even secular grounds. But the point is, did the legislature in that particular instance promote a murder statute in order to promote the biblical, biblical teaching that murder should not be sanctioned in society? That is the point. Certainly we could have a lot of different um, adultery statutes, sodomy statutes, murder statutes that may have secular purposes or even may have religious motivations or concerns. But what we are concerned about most is what, what message is the government of Guam sending to the people of Guam about whether or not the primary effect of this law is advancing or inhibiting religion. And I would submit, Your Honor, that actually this case is much more like the moment of silence law in Wallace, where it was found, as is the case here, that the law's actual purpose is to advance religion. I might note for the court, and actually the, pro the court probably has already realized this because we have argued this in our brief, that the defendant has advanced a secular purpose. And they claim that the secular purpose is the testimony of three doctors, um, that life begins at conception. But those three doctors did not testify at the legislative hearing. Again, we're looking at the legislative history. What did the legislature look at? Their post-enactment rationales can in no way serve as evidence of the secular purpose for this particular statute. How did they get the preamble then? 
Actually, Your Honor, I think the evidence is quite clear that they adopted the express language of the Webster preamble um, in the Guam statute. But again, it was motivated, and the primary purpose of adopting this preamble was to give effect to the religious belief of when life begins by outlawing abortion at all stages of pregnancy on Guam. The Webster panel said, well, we just can't deal with that clause, uh, that opening clause, because as far as we can tell, it just doesn't have any effect yet. Can we behave otherwise? Well, Your Honor, yes, you can, primarily because of the evidence that I have just cited to the court about what the legislative history of this law was, but well, also wasn't because... Wasn't the Supreme Court, though, in Webster saying uh, whether this is right or wrong, we don't need to get to it until we see whether this law ever has any effect at all? Except that the Supreme Court in Webster also did not rule on the preamble because it did not find that the act regulated the doctor's medical practice in any way. Of course, that is not the case here. This law, by its finding that life begins at, con at, at that human life begins at conception, and by outlawing abortions, definitely regulates and affects the doctor's medical practice in this case. That is why this case is so distinguishable from Webster. We would therefore ask that this court invalidate the statute on Establishment Clause grounds. The district court did not reach this ground. It did not reach this ground, Your Honor, but clearly it was a troublesome and a serious question for Judge Munson. Troublesome enough that he had to quote the author's statement, that he quoted Governor Adda's transmittal letter to the legislature where he said, you know, I am signing this bill into law because of my personal beliefs that a fetus is a human being. And he cited the passage in one of the Supreme Court cases about the Establishment Clause. The second part of my question is, should we? We think that, that this court should, first because there's there is such a clear violation of the Establishment Clause here, and this act is so egregious in its primary purpose of endorsing religion and, in effect, establishing Catholicism as the religion of Guam. We ask this court to reach this issue in addition to the privacy grounds because Otherwise, there would be nothing to prohibit the Guam legislature, the governor of Guam, or other state officials from enacting laws that advance a particular religion and that endorse a particular religion. This is a very compelling reason for this court to reach this ground. The fourth and final ground on which we ask this court to invalidate the statute is based on our free speech claim. And, that, and we ask this court to reach this issue because the prohibition on speech is a separate and distinct ground for finding the act unconstitutional. Under Section 3 of the Act, every person who procures any woman to take any medicine, drug, or substance to cause an abortion is guilty of a third-degree felony. Like Sections 4 and 5, this section would criminalize speech between a woman and her doctor about the, the availability of, need for, and access to abortion. Wasn't this an issue you did not raise below? We did not raise the procurement free speech argument in Section 3 below, Your Why Honor. Because I think the Ninth Circuit generally has um, a more open approach towards uh, adopting or addressing issues that may not have been raised in the district court, but were fully addressed in this court um, here. And also, because we have presented enough factual evidence to, suppo to support this particular argument. And where it is simply a question of law rather than just a factual question, this court is free to affirm the district court's judgment on any ground, including the procurement argument section. In addition, this section, which, provide, which prohibits procurement of a woman, is so clearly in violation of free speech rights. As we have advanced in our brief, when the word procure precedes an object, it generally means to obtain, but here it precedes a person, that is, the woman. In Black's Law Dictionary, the definition of, of Procure as such is to persuade, induce, prevail upon, or cause a person to do something. Speech is the way in which people persuade, induce, or prevail upon others to do something. Thus, we contend that procure reaches speech that informs a woman about or encourages women to have abortions. Section 3 will impinge on pr protected speech, including speech between a doctor and a patient regarding any method of abortion. This precludes health care professionals, such as the nurses, who are plaintiffs in this case, and the plaintiff doctors from complying with their ethical and legal obligations to provide information necessary to enable their patients to exercise informed consent. 
Section 3 also prohibits mere speech regarding abortion and its availability, which is unconstitutional. Section 3 is unconstitutionally overbroad because it chills speech advocating change in Guam's abortion law. Yet, under Supreme Court precedent, which we have cited in our brief, government cannot constitutionally curtail speech advocating change and challenging existing law. Finally, Section 3 will chill individuals from speaking about the availability of legal abortions in other jurisdictions, which is unconstitutional under the Bigelow decision of the Supreme Court. In conclusion, we ask this court to reaffirm the validity of Roe and to uphold the District Court of Guam's opinion that Public Law 2134 violates Roe and its progeny. We also ask this court to go beyond deciding this case on privacy grounds because there are compelling reasons to do so. That is to prevent the Guam legislature, Governor Atta, and other state officials from enacting laws that violate religious freedom, that prevent freedom of speech, and that create laws that are so vague and ill-defined that they create uncertainty and confusion on the part of citizens and law enforcement officials alike. I will conclude with a statement in Chamorro, our native language on Guam. On behalf of Maria Doe and the plaintiff class of women, the plaintiffs in court today, and the people of Guam, put forward, protehi yidiretsun mami giza guahan. Please protect our rights on Guam. May I ask one technical question before yes, you Runner. sit down? Does your cause of action depend on 1983, Section 1983? Yes, it does, Your Honor. And we would ask this court to find that under Narangas and the footnote 14 in Will, Section 1983 applies to Guam territorial officials acting in their official capacity, so long as the lawsuits seek prospective and injunctive relief. That's the basis on which you raise the constitutional claims. That's correct, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Mr. Leibowitz, Mr. Linton, uh, you have five minutes, which you may divide or use individually. Thank you, Your Honor. I think to address the, uh, the argument that uh, Ms. Ariola made in the order in which they made them, she made them, first of all, I believe that there's a misunderstanding of the facial challenge standard, both with respect to the Roe question and also with respect to facial vagueness. The law is clear with respect to both types of challenges that the law must be un unconstitutional in all possible applications. Is that true where fundamental rights are involved? I have not, I'm not aware of any case of the Supreme Court distinguishing between fundamental rights and cases that do not involve fundamental rights for that purpose and in fact in the context of abortion the court has repeatedly applied the facial challenge rule. They applied it in Webster, they applied it in uh, Rust v. Sullivan, they applied it in Ohio versus Akron Center, the second Akron Center case. So I think the answer to your question, Your Honor, is based upon the Supreme Court president is yes, that they have. Uh, and I think the same rule applies to their facial vagueness challenge. They must show that this law is impermissibly vague in all of its applications. The only way that this law could be vague in all of its applications is if the health exception to which uh, ju uh, Judge Canby referred is so open-ended as to include arguably any type of abortion. That simply is not the case. The record in this, uh, in this appeal shows beyond any question that very few abortions are done for any reason arguably related to health. The plaintiffs, first of all, do not even ask their patients why they have abortions. Secondly, they've stated that only a handful of abortions are medically necessary out of the dozens and dozens that they have performed on Guam. Third, they cited a survey done by the Alan Guttmacher Institute, Stanley Henshaw's declaration to the plaintiff's evidence. Again, we included that article, Why Do Women Have Abortions, in the excerpts of record. It's before the court. That shows that only 3% of women surveyed in a very comprehensive study done by the Guttmacher Institute, only 3% of women named health as the primary reason for seeking an abortion only 7% even mentioned health as a reason that entered into their decision to have an abortion. Fully 90%, 90% of the abortions were sought for socioeconomic reasons. It's in the report, it's their evidence, and I think it shows that there's no health dimension here with, with respect to the vast majority of applications of this statute. Finally, according to Dr. Yetman's declaration, there is evidence, there's no question, that 95% of abortions are done by the 16th week of pregnancy, by which time 
you normally do not have maternal indications for abortion, very few before that point. Again, it indicates that most abortions are done for non-health reasons. Given that, given the fact that very few abortions are done for any reason relating to health, the question of whether or not the law may be vague in some applications simply is not before this court because this is a facial challenge. I think that the plaintiff's establishment clause argument, uh, frankly, is frivolous and flies in the face of the Supreme Court's decisions in Harris versus McRae and Webster versus Reproductive Health Services. Uh, Judge Canby asked a question as to, uh, isn't this analogous to the preamble in, in the Webster case? Indeed, this was taken from the preamble to the Webster case. The court said, we, not, we need not address that because it has no operative effect. Similarly, the legislative finding in this law has no operative effect. It may explain why the law was adopted, but it, in itself, it does not have any operative effect. So for that reason, uh, it should not have any bearing upon the constitutionality of the statute. Moreover, it's an entirely proper finding to make uh, based upon evidence of when human life begins. Plaintiff's free speech argument, they've said uh, in their presentation today that Section 3 so clearly is in violation of free speech rights. It was so clear that they did not discover it until appeal. I suggest that issue has been waived by the plaintiffs. Moreover, even if it hasn't been waived, it's clearly, uh, clearly a misreading of Section 3, the use of the word procurement. Finally, a word about self-determination, and then I'll have Mr. Leibowitz address one final point. You have one minute left. Thank if Mr. You. Leibowitz is going to address it, he better do it now. Ye yes, Your Honor. There is self-determination provided for the people of Guam. There would be a referendum under this law if this law were upheld. So the people will be able to choose. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honor, Judge, Judge Camby, I just wanted to respond to your 1983 question of, of Ms. Ariola. In our view, the entire case could have been conducted, and indeed was conducted, without any concern for 1983. 1983, the way it has been converted now, and what operative in this case is as become an insurance policy, a legal insurance policy for constitutional litigation. And it acts as a danger to, to governments who have to who have to worry now in defending any statute, not just this statute, that there will be a legal fee that they have to pay not only their own attorneys, but the other side. And that there are great dangers in that kind of thing. Might might be an argument you'll have to address to Congress. Depends on, I guess, on the interpretation. I mean, range. that's what 1988 was passed to pay for 1983 suits if they if they prevail. It, and if and if 1983 was necessary to the case. Thank you, Mr. Leibowitz. Thank you, Mr. Linton. Ms. Ariola, the case was well argued. The court will take a recess until three o'clock. All rise. Professor Burton Weschler of the American University, um, any surprises in the oral arguments that we've just seen? Um, no, but I thought that the, I thought that that all three lawyers.